Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome again to another session of the FRCS Mentor uh, webinar a teaching session and Bible session, which will be at the end of uh, this talk. Um, naturally, the talk will be recorded and put on our website and on our YouTube channel. The Bible session will not be. Um, as you're aware, the FRCS Mentor Group uh, ha is uh, always uh, providing uh, webinar sessions on Wednesday evening. But we also do courses. If you go to our website, you'll find uh, uh, Bible practice courses there. Um, and there's quite a few courses coming up again. Uh, so keep an eye out. Uh, we're trying to keep always uh, maintain, uh, catch up, keep up with demand. Um, we have the Concise Orthopedic Notes uh, textbook. We believe it's uh, very good. We think it's worthwhile purchasing any proceeds from this. Uh, go to help maintain our ability to provide this service free. Also, if you're visiting our YouTube channel, please do subscribe because again, the, uh, any advertising on that is actually used to maintain the cost of, of providing these webinar sessions. Of course, all our mentors provide their time free of hand. And uh, today we're lucky to have uh, Hany Obarfesi, who is going to uh, give us a talk, talk on um, statistics for the FRCS part two. Part one is on the YouTube channel. Um, everyone knows Hani. Um, he is one of our FRCS mentors. He has an interest in, of course, basic science, but his main area of interest in surgery is in knee surgery. Um, without further ado, Hani, if you want to go ahead. Good evening, everyone. So today is the part uh, two of our statistics for FRCS. So, I just want uh, to remind everyone about our book, which is, I think it's very helpful for preparation of FRCS in general. So what is objectives today? So we will discuss the bias, other type of studies like cohort studies, case control studies, case series and expert opinions, critical appraisal, phases of clinical trials, how to conduct trial, screening test, box whisker plot, survival analysis, measuring performance like final plot and outcome scores. So bias, what is bias? So bias like a flow in impartiality, like any systematic error, while in, in, in the methodology of your like study or trial or whatever it's considered bias. Bias has a different types. So the first one is a selection bias. So you are doing a trial or a study and you're comparing like one type of knee replacement to another one and you selected your patients straightforward cases in, in that arm and elderly patients with obese high PMI in another arm that means that that's selection bias because what that would affect the results because we are expecting like from elderly people, like obese patients, more complications. So that would affect, that's considered bias. So it is a systematic error due to non-random sample. So how you can deal with that is randomization. So you shouldn't know, like if you are doing a trial, comparing between two things, you have randomly allocated like the, the patient in each arm, you don't know, that will be blinded. So you, that is to avoid selection bias. So Another type of bias is ascertainment bias. So knowledge of intervention. If the surgeon or the patient knows that like, is this patient going to this treatment or the patient knows that is going to this treatment, that is ascertain bias, especially if there is a belief that is like one treatment is better than the other. So if I'm doing like comparing like a, a knee replacement with another prosthesis. So I don't know, I will do the surgery. I don't know the patient in each arm. I will do except inside the surgery, but not before that. And overcome again by randomization. So, and there is a publication bias as well. So you finish your study and you analyze your, your data, but you found like some complication, some like uh, uh, side effects and you hide that, you change your results, that is publication bias. So 
randomization we discussed that in the in the last uh, lecture but we will just a quick recap how you can do randomization you can do randomization by computer like computer generated or stratified stratified if you are going to do like a small size sample of population like for an example 10 in each arm or 20 in each arm you will try to 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 each group should have <clears throat> the same numbers of population like age gender bmi you will you will like if the same like the same thing knee replacement so i have in each arm i i should have the same number of patient over 65 and the same number of young patient the same number of female the the same the same number of male and so on so that is called stratifications but if you are doing like very big study multi central study like and the population size maybe 1000 it's very hard to use a stratified so you have to do blocking block you will do like each block like for an example will has about four or six patients and you will try to to like include in, in every block the the, the the all categories of, of population so like elderly patient obese patient low high bmi low bmi male female young and uh, and elderly so that's called blocking and that is because stratified and the block are similar but usually this block in large study and that is why so you do like each each block will be small and it has everything all the categories Okay, so we'll go next to the other types of studies, like a cohort study. What's cohort study? Cohort study, it is, it's almost the same like randomized control study, but it's no randomization. And it is like re retrospective. So randomized control study is a prospective. So you will start now, you collect the patients and you will compare the outcomes in the future. The cohort is a reverse, like you will doing you, you had like, you, you will compare like between like a two knee and triathlon knee for the last five years. And you will, you will, you, you will assess the measurements, the, the like Oxford knee score, Harris knee score and whatever. And you will compare the outcomes between the two arms. That is a cohort study. So there is no control here because you, because you compare something in the past, not in the future. And there is like case control study. It is almost, almost the same like cohort study. I, I usually like got confused between differentiation between them, especially in the MCQ. Actually the case control, you have a case and you have a control group. You have a, like case is a studies where individuals with a certain outcome case are compared to the individual without the out outcome. That is a control. The good thing is this study is it's quick and it's cheap to perform and you can give you like relevant information that all the ratio. For an example, if you have a, like 100 patient got exposed to like a new vaccine, like COVID vaccine and 10 patients got like DVT. So the risk ratio here is 10% and the odd ratio here is 10 by 90. So you can, you can calculate that from the case control study. Uh, and that's like particularly useful in trying to identify the cause of uncommon disease and how, uh, 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 but it has a lot of methodological biases because there is no randomization and it is like, it is a retrospective. So it, it has a lot of methodological uh, biases. And the other, type is a case series which is observational study like example you are doing like knee replacement in vulgar deformity and you'll do a 50 cases will follow up this patient for four or five years there is no comparison there is no randomization but the we usually use this case series as a basement for trial like a pre-trial stage like for an example, if there is like a new prosthesis, like uh, prosthesis for the toes, for an example, like first MT, uh, uh, MTB uh, arthroplasty, it's a new, arthro new, new things, not, it's not used before. Like we'll use a case series first, uh, three cases 
of the new arthroplasty in the, in the, in the toe and you will follow up that and you will get your, your outcomes and you will use that like a base for setting a randomized controlled tri trials. And the last thing is the expert opinions, like elite surgeons give, give like his experience uh, and, he, and his opinion uh, according to his long experience. We'll go then to critical appraisal. Actually, it's, it's, I don't think that uh, it's common in the, in the FRCS exam, but maybe like may come as a, as a, as a surprise uh, question. So what is, what is a critical appraisal? Is assessment of the research study. Like, is this a study worth to clinical practice? The conclusion from this study worth clinical practice, yes or no? It has, a, it has four phases. Number one, rapid critical appraisal. Like, I use a BICO technique, like population intervention comparison and outcome. And that is a rapid critical appraisal. Then you, you, you evaluate, you do evaluation of these studies together and they put the, 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 the results in a table and they'll compare it as a body of evidence. After that, census, you will like certain that data will provide a snapshot and you use this particular clinical issue pulled out and put it like a showcase from the table. After that, you will come to the recommendations. Uh, about the best practice. Okay, so evidence-based practice process. What is that like, how you can get like the guidelines, recommendations. So number one, you will identify like a spirit of inquiry to notice the internal data that indicate opportunity for positive change. Then you have the clinical question using the BICUT. So we'll use the, like the, 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 the papers or the studies about this topic and you'll assess that to leading the population intervention with the BICO technique. And now they added the T, which is the time of the outcome, like five years outcome, three years outcome. Then step two, conduct a systematic research to find out what's already known about this clinical issue. You have to go like, go like PubMed or whatever, and you find about what, what's written about that topic in the literature. Step three, conduct critical appraisal again. So we'll do the, 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 the four steps. Then implement best practice, blending external evidence with, clini with clinician exper uh, experience and the patient preference and values. Then evaluate that. So after implementation, you will evaluate evidence implementation to see if the study outcomes happen in practice and if the implementation went well or not. Okay. And the last thing, so the step six, share your result. Okay, so I think it's, it, it will be like a surprising question if it comes in the FRCS, but it's, it's, not, it's not so difficult. You can easily answer that question. Okay, so this is a common one, how to conduct a trial. You are doing a RCT, how you conduct that. Number one, identify the problem. For an example, patient with ankle osteoarthritis, we treat them with arthrodesis or total ankle replacement. That is a the problem. Then identify the gold standard. I will go to, to the, the search about that topic. What, 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 is, what, what is the outcome? What is the benefits of, of that research? And it is like, can, 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 I, can I do that or not? Is it safe or not? Then I will write my protocol, design study, a population. I will do power analysis, how many patients needed to be involved in each group, uh, how to do a power analysis. Actually, it's a program. You will enter like your study data, the, the patient reported outcomes that go, are going to use the complications risk. And after that, he will give you the exact number used in each arm. And usually like if, 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 if it's like the, uh, it, it, it tells you like you need to include about 88 patient in your trials, that means 44 in each trials. So you have to put extra patients. You will use a 50, 50, 50 versus 50 because to avoid like, definitely you have a patient with loss of follow-up. So to get a significant result, add extra number of patients above that after doing the power analysis. Then decide what, what kind of randomization are going to use. Like do the uh, like computed 
randomization, are you going to like stratified blocking technique, whatever. And you have to mention that. What's your inclusion and exclusion criteria? So I will, inc I will exclude patient below 50 years. I will exclude patient above certain limits. I will, I will exclude a patient with diabetes, Charcot disease, whatever. And you have to, to decide what is the study timeline. So I will do a follow-up of both like arms for five years, 10 years. Okay, now we have the protocol. You will send it to the, for ethical approval. So you have like ethical committee in each university. Uh, you have to, to send and you have to get ethical approval before starting your research. After that, collect data, analyze your data, write up your paper and publish. Okay, that's me. It might come as a separate question. What is the ethical committee? So ethical committees, professors from the university. And okay, how you can get ethical approval for your trials? Okay, the application must include, what is the study details? Number one, number two, the consent you have to attach the consent for uh, in, in, in your uh, application, plus the protocol. Who is the investigators? So like who is the main investigators and and who is like who is going to help him then is there any funding is there any sponsor so which company are going to use for the ankle arthroplasty is are you going are you going to receive any like funding from that company yes or no that's very important to highlight in in your application and the study insurance each rct has like has to to, to have insurance like if you are working in the HSC in Ireland or NHS, I think all the doctors have like have like uh, uh, insurance related to the HSC or NHS. But but you have to mention that. Five. What is the details of, of the procedure to which humans will be subjected? Like you you have it will be part of the descriptions of like your study, and what is the benefits? So you have to mention the benefit of this trial. Okay, for an example, all the patients that got uh, ankle arthrodesis, they are young, they are not happy. There is an osteoarthritis of the knee, osteoarthritis of the tarsal joint, for an example. They lose the function. But there is a paper published about the ankle arthroplasty mentioned is the patient satisfaction is, 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 is satisfactory. The range of motion is better and the, 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 the complication is not, is not that bad. So how to convince the ethical committee about your uh, trial. And you have to, to mention the potential risk. Okay, it is not the best thing in the world. It is, has some complications like infection, aseptic, aseptic loosening, but is like any others are so blasted, but it's not successful like a knee or hip replacement, but in some part or some studies mentions that the risk or complication is not that bad. And alternative procedure as well, like ankle arthroplasty or in soles conserved treatment. Are you going to receive any payment or reward from this study? You have to mention that as well. And information of, a, of previous ethical application. Usually if you are going to apply for RCT, if there is another RCT with the same titles, mention that, that will like make your application more strong and will easily be approved. Okay, this one might come as a separate question. Okay, consent me for your trial. How you can consent a patient for RCT? What's the criteria of that consent? It is different from like consent for knee replacement or, or, or surgery, it's a different one. You have to mention at, at the beginning, what is the title of that study? It's very clear. Who is the researcher, the name and the detail, phone number and email address. It's not necessarily to be like the, 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 the consultant or the registrar phone number, but at least the, the hospital uh, or the orthopedic department secretary phone number and the email, official email. And you have to mention the purpose of the study, detail of the procedures like are going to do like a hip or like for example, I'm, I'm, we are running a, a trial now in our, in, in our hospital about the distal radius fracture, like four weeks versus six weeks, if you are going to do conservative treatment, four weeks, six weeks in cast. So what, 
you have to mention that to the patient. Risk. What is the risk of, uh, after that? You might get like stiffness or pain, like loss of reduction, for an example. You have to mention that. And the benefits. And you have to, to, to be, to, to tell the patient like less time for immobilization, it might have some benefits for early range of motion, less stiffness, early rehab, less risk of complex regional pain syndrome, for an example. And you have to mention as well the randomization. You have to tell the patient that he will be randomized to one of each arm. And the, the, the researcher will not know there is maybe like independent uh, research nurse will be responsible for that. And the computer will be uh, responsible for that. So you have to mention that in the consent as well. And the very good things, you have to mention that the patient has, has the right to withdraw from this research at any time. Okay, that's very important point in your consent and confidentiality so you have to mention that the patient name patient detail will not be involved in in, in the in in your study so anonymous everything could be anonymous okay so next screening this is a very common FRCS question how you can do screening test Number one, identify unrecognized disease in people without sign and or symptoms must have very high sensitivity and is very specific. What is the uh, WHO guidelines for a screening test? You have to have like a known effective treatment for the condition and the pathology will be understood and the facilities of diagnosis and the treatment should be available. And it should be a latent stage of the disease. And there is the test itself, non-invasive and acceptable to the population. And natural history of the disease is to be understood. Should be agreed policy to whom to treat as well. And the cost, it should be this test is cost effective as well. And if the treatment starts early, there's more benefits from started later. Okay, is another one. Sometimes it might come like a separate question. What is that? That is box whisker plot. Okay, tell me about that. What, what, what you see here? So why we use it, number one. So analyze numerical data. So information about range, median, interquartile, center density, and spread for numerical data. That's very important. Okay, what is the line in the center is the median. What is the other, like each one, like the, the green, the two green lines, the first uh, and second quarantile, uh, interquarantile range indicated by the box. And there is a whisker, which is the line up and the line, the vertical line up and down, which is upper and lower value beyond the considered outliers. Okay, so the survival analysis, how you can do survival analysis? There is a different methods of an analyzing <clears throat> the survivor's outcome of intervention. It's very common for hip, like arthroplasty, like hip or knee arthroplasty, doing survival analysis. Uh, like intervention is plotted over time. So, which allows the variable dates of entry and different lengths of follow up. You can do the, like table, how you can do that? Like life table, like th th this table, you will enter all the patients by numbers and you will, will mention the complication and what is the end point should, the end point should be defined like failure. What is failure here? Like revision of, of hip arthroplasty, that is the end point. And you, you mentioned that in the table. Okay, so how you construct life table for joint replacements, the end point as well should be defined and the number of joint being followed and the number of failure determined for each year after operation should be mentioned as well. And for each time period, what is the number of loss of follow up? What is the number of comb complication and failure for that? Another way is a Kaplan-Meier survival analysis. So we'll, we'll put in front of you that and you'll ask you, what is that? So I usually start with the X and Y. So what is, what, what is the, the Y is the proportion of failure? And what is the X is, is the number or the period of time. And you have three lines. You have two dotted lines, which is 
the uh, standard deviation and there is the, the, the line in the center which is the median. So outcome of, the of intervention plotted over time, X axis shows time, Y axis percentage of study population surviving, dotted line are the confidence intervals. This is two standard deviations. So the, you, as you see here, with the time, the distance between the two dotted lines become widened. So that is the because you lost a follow up of the patients. So now we have a wide confidence interval. So the proportion or the ratio of uncertainty become high. Okay. So, and you have like these lines, these are small lines here. Uh, the, this is represent like a loss of follow up or patient death or revisions. So you have a steps here and this is line. And you have here, like not all, like loss of full up, or if the patient refused to participate in the, after that, uh, that's not a failure, but we call that like uh, positive or censored lost patient uh, or, or, or positive outcomes. So the censored lost patient here, like identified with the little mark, this, this is small mark. Okay, so some patients refuse to do a follow-up. Okay, so measuring performance. So this is very common as well, very, very common FRCS. So what is that? So the same technique. What is in the X? What is in the Y? What is the line in the center? What is the two blue lines? What is the two red lines? What is these dots? So that is your technique of answering th this question. So, so you have the Y lines with the proportion of failure. And what is the, the, the X uh, line with is the, the numbers over time? Okay, so what is the line in the center, which is the median, or the, sorry, the mean. And you have two uh, blue lines, which are the uh, one standard deviation. And you have two red lines, which are two standard deviations. You have dots above here, this area called positive uh, negative outliers and this area here under the red lines called positive outliers that means it's less complications here is more complication okay so how int you interpret that so this area here so it's, they are not a bad surgeon but need justification so the bu the buzzword here is justification so it might this surgeon they do like the most complex cases or they, they did like a, a small number of patients. Like if you did like a 10 total hip uh, replacement and there is a two, like a dislocation or two infection, that is 20%, it's very high like percentage. But if you did a 100, it might only have a, only two or three dislocation. So the area here is just need justification. And the area here, that is a positive, that is, is very good, but as well, it might did like five hip replacement and there is no complication at all. Your, your, your complication rate is zero. That, that doesn't mean that you're best surgeon in the world, but because it, that you did only a small number of operations. But here, when you go into the right, that's another thing. This is the negative outliers here. You have to do something about that. So that's unex like, unaccepted complications with a big number of, of, of operations. So that, that one need like investigation. So you will, if, you, if you've said that well, let me ask you what you were going to do with this, like this, this surgeon did like unexpected rate of infection, what you will, what you're going to do. So the same, like my duty towards the patient, my duty towards the, my colleague and my duty toward my institution. So for infection, I will stop him doing surgery for patient safety. And for him, I will go through his case. I will discuss his technique. I, I will see what, what, what he did, why he has this big number of infection. And for the institution, I will speak to the lead clinician to discuss the higher rate of complication for that surgery. Okay, so outcome scores. What is outcome scores? So is a questionnaire are given to the patients pre and post procedure, like pre before the knee replacement and after the knee replacement. 
in relation to the outcome relating to the intervention. So what's called PROMS, patient reported outcome scores. Why we need it? We, we need it in the research. If you are going to like to use a, a, a new knee replacement, new hip replacement, or a new surgery, how you can know that the, the, like your surgery is successful or not? You have to use outcome score. So you use that for research, quality improvement, audit, and economic evaluation. How to choose that? The outcome score have to be reliable, valid, and it's used in a similar patient demographics. So don't use like, I, I, if you are doing like a knee replacement and you are working in the UK, it's better to use Oxford knee score. Other one using like outcomes from North America or from the Middle East. So what is the patient reported outcome? What is the promise? It, it may be patient specific subjectives. Like you are like, for, there is a, a, a common one look, look, uh, called McMaster Toronto arthritis. Why are doing total hip replacements? So the patient is specific. And maybe disease is specific. Like for hip, there is a Harris hip score, X, Oxford hip score. Uh, WOMAC for osteoarthritis. And generic, like the most two comments, like generic uh, prompts is F12 and SF36. They are very common use because the gen general quality of life. Maybe a region specific, Oxford Hub score, uh, Oxford New score. There is 12 question. It's you, so severity of pain, right? Night pain, any sudden pains. You may ask, the, the examiner may ask you, okay, so you have a patient specific, disease specific. What's your, tell me about a score you use in your practice. So you have to pick one and you have to know it. You have to discuss it to explain it to the examiner. So for the, the most two common example, Oxford hip score or knee score, and it's only 12 questions. It's easy to be, uh, uh, to recall that in the exam. Thank you. One question from Hitam Abuziet. And he says, the central line in funnel plot represent the mean or represent the effect size of combined estimate of meta-analysis. I, I couldn't, uh, would you repeat that again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, he's put the central line in a funnel plot, I think he means, does it represent the mean or does it represent the effect size of the combined estimate of meta-analysis? Okay, I think he, he got confused between the funnel plot and the forest plot. We don't use the funnel plot, the, the forest plot usually use that in the meta-analysis. So there is a central line which represents any difference between the two, the, the like the control group and uh, uh, investigate the other groups, the two groups, for an example, if you're going to like uh, total knee replacement, the telefemoral uh, uh, joint arthroplasty for isolated the telefemoral uh, osteoarthritis. So this is one part, one part. There is a diamond. If this diamond like touching the central line, that means there is no difference. There is no significant difference. We use that in the meta-analysis, but in the, in the final plot, it's a different thing. That's the performance. So it's not like a study. We will, we will assess the performance. It's a different thing. Okay, thanks, honey. Um, I hope that made sense. So I've also got a question. I just kind of see who's asked it. Um, from Jabez, is the cohort study always retrospective? Yes. Okay. And a question from Norman, um, the di what's the difference between a case control and a cohort study? Yes, it's very confused. One word, the cohort study is analytic study. The case, the case, uh, the other type as a case control study is the uh, uh, observational study. So this is analytic and this is observational. Okay, that's all the questions that I have. Um, I'll hand back to Schwan. It's excellent talk, honey. Um, uh, uh, really strong uh, parts two to a very excellent part one, which um, I'm sure everyone's going to go back and review again as well as this video. Um, as always, guys. Um, if you have any questions, please do ask.
but uh, if there isn't any overwhelming question, does any of the mentors have any questions that would be pertinent for the candidates? Um, honey, I want to ask you, um, if you if you were selecting your which study you want to do, um, how would you answer that as a question? Actually, in the exam or in the in the in the exam. Okay, I I I, I would like I will pick the studies that I'm I, I really like uh, understand it or I can speak about in the exam. For example, the RCT. For, for me, I will pick the RCT because it has a, lo a lot of things to discuss and to tell the page to the examiner about it. Mm. Um, well, uh, my approach to the, that question is specifically what is the question that needs to be answered by the study. Um, so I wouldn't immediately pick uh, uh, RCT because the the prob the you need to know what is the question and what is the topic. So, for example, something extremely rare that uh, has very few patients and or uh, events you may not be able to do an uh, rct yes. Yes. yeah absolutely it has a, yeah special criteria to be done yeah, yeah. so uh, my approach would always be to answer with what is the question and uh, i would design i would design my study and select the type of study based on the uh, the condition i'm studying the population I'm studying it in, and the event that I'm trying to study. So uh, events which are very common, which are every day, and we can recruit large numbers of patients. The ideal study would be a prospective randomized control, uh, triple blinded trial. Um, while a, a condition which is extremely rare, which is very hard to find patients to recruit to, or the event is really rare, and maybe only a case series may be appropriate uh, in these situations because we don't have enough patients to even begin a prospective randomized control trial. Yeah. Um, but a, a, a collection of data on those patients may be appropriate. So, it but saying it this way, you recognize that you studies can you, the superiority of RCT is not always available to us, and yeah. sometimes yeah. a case. Uh, series is just enough or is all you can do and is the best possible thing you can do yeah. does that make sense uh, uh, candidates guys everyone okay um, uh, answering it this way will also demonstrate that you have thought about this and also that uh, you understand the principle behind your uh, behind research uh, okay well done um, anything else Okay, if there's no other questions, uh, honey, excellent talk. Uh, oh, thank you. Difficult topic to get your, your uh, head around, and you did that really well. Thank you very much. You. Um, the we'll end the recording part of this session. As always, we're going to have uh, viral sessions afterwards. And just a reminder to everybody um, that we do what this every Wednesday. Um, you are very welcome to uh, join the FRCS mentor. Uh, FRCS preparation group just uh, send one of the mentors a uh, um, request to join and you can always uh, go to the FRCS uh, web FRCS mentor web page and email us and we will add you to the FRCS preparation group on our telegram app um, everything we do is given uh, free free of time for my mentors so thank you again to all the mentors that participated today that includes uh, Hani uh, Nikki, um, Siri, who's joined us, and David Hughes as well. Uh, thank you, everybody.